Welcome back everyone to Engineers. We've got Sara here. Um, we've got Sara here from Monolith AI. He's ex um, who have actually IPO'd this week. And Sara's very kindly said that he'd donate to every single viewer uh, a beer of their choice. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but we've got Sara here who's CTO at Monolith AI. And he's going to investigate or help us investigate a little bit further around uh, data science um, and engineering and that relationship, agility within those relationships and give us an insight into software companies and engineering itself. We'll go into some of those depths a little bit greater. So, Sarah, nice to have you on board. Do you want to just give us a little bit of insight into you? Uh, that Palantir background would be interesting and what it was like to work there. But really, let's focus on Monolith AI as well. But nice to see sure. you. Nice to have you. Okay. Thank you very much, Elliot. Pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, I kind of, um, have a software development background. I've worked in a mix of startups and big data analysis. Like you said, most recently at Palantir um, for two years um, before joining Monolith AI. Um, so yeah, Palantir was very useful, obviously, as a B2B company, um, which has its differences to B2C. Yeah. Um, but as, yeah, it was a big learning kind of first full-time role out of uni, um, learning a lot about the business side of things, of um, how to get to customers, how to keep users happy. Um, and yeah, a lot of that has then flown over nicely to applying that at Monolith. Yeah, nice. What, what would you say... This is probably putting you on the spot slightly, but what would you say your your biggest learning was now that you've had some chance to reflect? Uh, I think the biggest one was kind of how you balance um, keeping a customer happy and doing what they need with building a product that's more generic and can then use those learnings for other other clients and other users. Um, I think it's very easy to hack something together quickly that keeps the customer happy. And often they, ha they have very specific needs. Yeah. Um, but the ability to take that and try and draw generalizations with other users who seem to be asking for completely different things, um, but finding the commonalities amongst them is a very difficult problem. Um, but I think it's really valuable and helps you build a product that scales better. Yeah. W was that an ethos? Uh, at Palantir, was that really drilled through some of the teams that you should do this? I think it's one that they've grown over time and that now is like a big part of it. Like obviously Palantir is selling its own software and is giving the same software to everyone. Um, and they've had um, discussions um, and media around kind of how does this scale? They seem to do a lot of consulting work as well. Um, which is a, obviously a tricky part, especially at an IPO and you're looking at valuations. Yeah. Is it a consultancy or a software company? Um, it's very much a software company. Um, and so, like you say, I think it's a big cultural part of like, um, how do you feed back the learnings to the core product yeah. um, as much as possible? Nice. Okay. So two years on, or <laughs> two years, now CTO of a software company, Monolith AI, do you want to give us the overarching view of who Monolith AI are and what they sure. do? I love your tagline <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah. um, and we'll, so, de we'll dive deep into that after, but talk to us about Monolith. Sure. So Monolith is aiming to improve engineering development. And I know I use engineering in this case to mean physical engineering. So automotive, aerospace, kind of anything you're physically building. Um, and so kind of the tagline you mentioned is like an engineering superpowered. Um, and the real part that we're trying to help is um, if I take building a car, um, takes several years to do. Um, and you go through this process, this R&D process where you come up with initial designs, um, you do sip, um, computer simulations to try them, then you build small prototypes, you do wind tunnel tests, then you build bigger prototypes, you build physical tests, mm -hmm. um, and you're constantly iterating. You, well, you, when you build a physical prototype, you see it didn't quite perform as good as you thought, so you have to go back, do some more tests, go iterate, and obviously a car is extremely expensive to build. You can only do this so many times. Um, 
So you have this very lengthy process, expensive process, um, but you're also generating a huge amount of data during all this testing. Um, and it's an area that can, like machine learning can really help in and isn't tapped as much as it ca can be. So Monolith is really all about how can we um, use machine learning to help speed up this process and reduce the time and money companies are spending on this R&D. Yeah. I'm sure without giving away too many secrets, <laughs> how do you do that? If we simplify, I, I think the other tagline is Monolith AI uses machine learning uh, yeah. software to look at and analyze, uh, I think it's complex engineering data. Correct. Okay. How do you do that? Sure. So... I, machine learning is obviously is a booming industry at the moment and you're seeing it applied in a lot of areas um, and common areas are things like computer vision, lots of image processing. Um, engineering is interesting because the data is typically 3D. Um, so you have the designs of a car, of a plane, of a shampoo bottle and you, look, you want to use that 3D design as input into your machine learning. Um, and so that's quite a like if you use the complex engineering data, it's quite specific to engineering. It's not really anywhere else that you get like 3D data as an input. Um, and so I guess that's our like kind of see one part of our secret source is kind of our ability to take in that 3D data and use it in machine learning models. Um, and the kind of techniques that you use are very specific to 3D in the same way that image processing has its own set of image processing specific um, techniques. Okay. Uh, and why why would 3D be more challenging than image processing? Help help us understand that because I think there'll be a lot of the audience listening that are really interested in some of what you're doing but probably maybe don't understand some of the nuances. So how can we understand that? Sure. So if I take, again, if I take image processing as an example, you've got a, well, a square rectangular grid and you have values on them. Um, and so you kind of, it's, I'm not, it's a very complex problem in its own right, <laughs> um, but you kind of have this grid of data. And 3D is weird because you've got, obviously, there's an extra dimension involved, um, but you have this non-linearity where the shape isn't just a nice rectangle. It's this, it can be a complex shape. Each, um, each car has different designs to it. There's curvatures that you want to preserve. There is kind of like um, you want certain straight lines and orthogonal connections um, and kind of preserving something that looks real and is a car is quite important. So like you obviously don't want a machine learning algorithm that tells you this is the best new car and it doesn't look like a car. Like <laughs> you need there's certain like natural aspects about what makes a geometry a geometry in a product um, that are quite hard to capture by kind of the standard um, machine learning techniques. Okay, so so how does your software fit in with customers? Do you look at, I guess, the designs right from scratch all the way through all levels of production, or do you just help at inception stage? Uh, we can go across, so we've done a mix. So um, like you say, the kind of inception stage um, kind of the stylists and kind of doing the initial designs and you want to tie that to the testing data that they've done. So that could be testing data at various stages in the pipeline, the early wind tunnel, the physical test, the manufacturing tests. Um, so the data that goes into that can be quite varied. It can be, like you say, the very early um, like computer simulations, but also at the end stage, like you don't want when you manufacture the prop product or attempt to you find that there's a problem like it breaks because it's just not manufacturable um, at that point you've sunk loads of money and time into getting it here and then you find a problem so actually it the like real value is like using data across your pipeline um, but to use that to identify a problem as early as possible the earlier you identify a potential problem the more time and money you're going to save yeah uh how might you identify some of those problems? Do, do you have 
maybe common trends that you look for or is there observability there that says that doesn't look right for what yeah. maybe a car design should look like or going through testing? Yeah, so the aim is basically to use your experience and what typically um, at the moment you might have like a human who looks at a design and goes, oh yeah, I can see that's going to be a problem. Um, and that works for a, l- a large part, but then obviously people move on, they retire, they move to a new job. Um, uh, and also it's a human process, things can fail. Yep. Um, and so a big part of what we want to do is you've made failures before, like that's okay. You've collected data on what designs failed. So if you've collected data on different designs that have failed as well as the ones that worked, Mm -hmm. when you're coming up with a new design, the machine learning has learned what works and what doesn't and can tell you actually, don't try this. This is gonna fail based on our, your experience of previous designs. Um, Or it can say like, based on this design that you're about to start manufacturing, these are the 10, most similar designs that you've tried before and look eight of them all also failed so maybe you should like pause and double check this is okay before continuing i bet customers love that <laughs> it's a very easy business value sell um like yeah time saving money saving is huge i, I can imagine and you mentioned shampoo bottles in the, in there as well um so i don't know if that's maybe a topic of conversation in the office but i can imagine your software is easily transferable and you could maybe diversify later down the line into different industries i'm sure that's probably on the cards um yes that is the intention i mean the intention it is true like like i said we've worked automotive and aerospace are two big industries fast but packaging is a huge one as well and i say always gets a little weight what as you say like you're working on like major um likes of like bmw and then you've also got people like l'oreal um it looks funny but at the end of the day they all have 3d geometries that they're building they all go through the same r d process of come up with designs test it iterate um so it's, it turns out to be a very generic process across engineering as a whole okay um i, I will ask you in uh, some questions further down the line around iterations because uh, I'm I'm hearing lots of things around being agile, iteration. So that, that's probably big for how you conduct yourselves internally. Um, what's it like to work at an AI company? Because um, you mention experience, you mention human intervention, and I understand there's probably a ton of machine learning models that you've built, algorithms that you've built. So what's it like combining the two? Really smart models and really smart people and being an AI company, what's that like? Yeah, I think that internally, it's like a really rewarding culture of extremely smart people who are all willing to help and teach each other. Um, I know when I first joined um, within the first month, I think over half our team had come from PhDs. I'm sitting there as the least qualified person. Um, it was a little bit intimidating at first, um, but it meant that everyone really helped me, taught me a lot, like, my machine learning knowledge was quite limited before, um, but they taught me a huge amount. Um, and yeah, it was like, I think that's a like really good way to learn. Um, I think AI is obviously a booming market at the moment. Um, and there's a lot online of how you can learn um, uh, yourself. Um, but for me, nothing became close to kind of actually doing it and working with people, making great models and explaining how they've done it, how they came to the model that they did. Um, Obviously, it's not always easy to get a job in AI without the experience, um, but I think it is like the best way to learn it and pick it up. Um, Yeah. I've I've spoken to someone really recently, actually, um, who who said the same thing, that the theoretical understanding and the practical experience are very different. What, why do you think in your own experience that is? And what learnings have you got from practical experience that you don't find in theoretical understanding? 
Uh, so I think there's a few aspects there. One of the big ones is kind of um, when you're doing it in a commercial setting versus an academic setting, um, you really care about not just how good the accuracy is, but really can a user use this? Can they actually get the benefit they want? Um, in this case, reducing the testing. Um, and if like, you can have the best model in the world, 99.99% accuracy, but if the user doesn't know how to use it um, or can't use it to get the predictions they need, then it's a waste of everyone's time. Um, so I think there's a huge amount that goes into the kind of deployment aspects of uh, machine learning that's really important and is often missed in a theoretical setting. Um, so that's definitely one big part. Uh, I guess the other big part is like understanding like what the end goal is or what a successful model looks like. Um, it typically, um, you might look at success in terms of like percentage accuracy, but for example, in engineering, that what matters might be very different. Um, an interesting one is in aerospace. You want to predict what amount of load of cargo that a plane can take and still be safe. Um, and in a normal ML setting, you might just say, I want to get as close as possible to that value. Um, mm -hmm. But in an aerospace, if you uh, under predict and say it can only handle, um, I don't know, one ton, um, and then rather than, even though in reality it can handle 1.2 tons, that's okay. No one's going to get hurt. You just didn't ship as much cargo as you wanted. Yep. But if you over predict and say it can handle 1.3 and it really can't, like, obviously disaster happens. Um, yeah. So that's, it's an interesting one where actually you can under predict as much as you like, just never over predict. Okay. Uh, and that's, um, those kind of commercial settings bring up different challenges about what a successful model looks like. Okay. That's really insightful. Is that quite reflective of Monolith's culture? Would you say internally? Because it seems like there's a whole load of brain power in many of your rooms and a PhDs and brain power is that your culture or or what is your culture like I think um the culture of kind of understanding the customer really deeply is really important um and a lot of why clients um like us is that we have machine learning experts but also engineers in the team and the engineers in particular have a really good understanding of what the customer's going through, their problem space, and can relay that back. Um, so really understanding the user and like on a really personal, deep level, understanding their workflow helps us make better machine learning models, helps us deliver a better service to customers. Um, and yeah, I think that's a really important part of we're not just um, tackling problems just because like it's a theoretical maths problem we're tackling like how can we give bring the customer some value um i think yes that's a big one that's part of our culture is like a, a customer first mentality yeah um uh, amazon-esque really it's worked out exactly. some hasn't it <laughs> it certainly has it's a good model to mimic yeah uh working b to b agility and going back to your points around iterations, it mm -hmm. is tough because mm -hmm. obviously that's, that's reactive to what a customer wants. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk to us about your views on agility or mm -hmm. agile at, at Monolith and, and how does that look or how do you have to be? Yeah, so it's a uh, balance. You want to, like, getting B2B clients is very difficult we're obviously talking about like household names and there's not that many that we can work with so you only have maybe have a few going at once and at that time like you really want to devote everything to making them happy but at the same time you know that if you hack things together that are too specific for that one customer you're building a huge amount of tech debt and you're not going to benefit from that for future clients um, so a lot of the agility is really around um, choosing your battles, choosing when you hack quickly and um, just make a quick prototype and choosing when you stop and go, actually, I've seen this problem three times now with different clients. There's a fourth client that's about to come that's going to have the same problem. Mm. Let's just stop, take a step back, understand the problem a bit more like gen generically and high level, and then let's see how we can tackle it as a whole. 
Um, it's a tough problem. We've got it right as many times as we've got it wrong. Um, but kind of knowing when to like go, yeah, go deep or when to just like get it done quickly. Okay. W- would you say that's like a, a, a hole for machine learning? A- agility in machine learning mm-hmm. is w- when to know when to maybe press and not press as in maybe use models or investigate or do some more research and the like is that what you yeah i think it applies very well there as well i think the with software it's a lot easier to kind of go this is our mvp we'll start here the next sprint we'll do this next and this on the third sprint and machine learning is a lot harder because you can't really estimate how long is it going to take for me to improve this model by 1%. Mm. You could hit the jackpot tomorrow. You could take three weeks and never quite hit it. Um, it's very much the nature of ML that you kind of you get these moments. And that makes it very hard to estimate and plan time. Um, so for us, a lot of the agility is, like you say, choosing when to like um, go down an avenue of like deep research that you don't know is going to pay off or not. Okay. Um, and also, I think time boxing activities and going, we're going to look into this. And if in two weeks time, it doesn't feel like we've made any progress, let's stop there. Um, otherwise, it's very easy to just keep digging. And like, the more you don't make any progress, you just dig more because you really want to. And it feels like you've sunk cost, um, but actually just going stopping and saying, okay, this isn't working, let's go a different way um, is an you know, yeah, important part of that okay. agility. Um, I guess me trying to understand that as well is just, I guess, taking a pragmatic view on each situation and looking at it and thinking, okay, have I seen this before? What should I do next? I guess that comes with experience. Exactly. Yeah. Big part of experience and a lot we've learned from from previous clients as well. Nice. Okay. Um, what what about code ownership? If If we look at code ownership and obviously understanding you build your software uh, you build the models algorithms for customers can we try and understand that code ownership piece and who owns what who's responsible for what and why yeah um it's a tricky one and there is a there's obviously like there's certain foundational aspects of the code base that our software team own, or particularly like the front end aspects of things um, and kind of the base platform. Um, but then choosing what like buttons appear, what models exist, the options to use for those models, the data scientists control. Um, so you almost have like the software team are uh, providing a service to the data science team in terms of providing APIs that the data science team can use to plug in their models. Um, so then there's always like a this area in between the two where it's like software team are kind of building it, but it's all Python. So the data science team can help out and do things. Um, there's definitely a gray area in between that is <laughs> tricky. I was going to ask about that collaboration and that synergy between the two, uh, the the software teams, the data science teams, uh, and obviously that that probably answers that somewhat. Yeah, I think it's a very cross functional in how we work, um, and yeah, even within data science, you have people who are data scientists and but understand software aspects. Um, obviously, they're coding, so they know um, code and they know the software parts. Um, but And then there's data scientists who just want to be like, stick to the models, stick to the research, um, and you have this spectrum. And so we have people in our team that move along that spectrum and sometimes they spend time on things that actually a software developer probably could do but so could the data scientists and they just choose to do it and sometimes they'll step away and leave it more as tasks for the software team to help um, support what well, what kind of software engineering and infrastructure challenges do you typically have doesn't need necessarily need to be like extremely in depth i'm just i'm just generally quite curious sure so i guess um part of our challenge like i said is supporting the data scientists and building this generic platform in which a data scientist can add their own models and their own like transformations um into the platform so like kind of providing the right apis um 
and adapting as we discover new things and the data scientists need new levels of flexibility. Um, and then from the potentially more infrastructure side of things is kind of how do we handle like lots of jobs going on at once? We can't, um, we can't hard code, like this is the exact model, like make it work just for this model. We need to make this generic platform um, and kind of handling things like big data scaling, um, running jobs like concurrently, uh, making sure the platform doesn't get blocked because one or two big models are running, um, kind of keeping all of that flowing in a way that a user is never going to get stuck. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite challenging, um, kind of trying to handle things as, things as generically as possible, knowing that today we have these like I don't know, these 10 common models, but tomorrow there's going to be 11th or 12th. Today we use 3D data. Maybe tomorrow we get a new type of data set. We start working with images, something else, like being ready to handle that is um, okay. part of the challenge. Yeah, okay. That's that's a tough challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going back probably about 10 minutes now, and you were talking about um, machine learning deployments mm -hmm. or uh, deploying models into production yeah. and from from what i understand mlops is becoming a big thing yeah okay why do you think it is a big thing and how can someone listening to this understand about putting models into production what, what does sure. it really mean yeah, so I guess as like machine learning started to be used more by companies and they're experimenting with it, um, you had this um, an initial boom of where companies were hiring data scientists. They were like getting them to set up models. You give them all the data, they start setting it up, um, and then they get eventually get great results and like okay, great. Um, now what? And it's like okay, um, I swear this model gets ninety nine percent accuracy. Um, but uh, the engineer, the banker on the desk, they need to be asked like, okay, what do I trade next? What do I test next? Um, like, how do I get it? Um, and if this model's sitting on one of the developers' like laptops or on a server somewhere, that's not helpful to anyone. Yeah. Um, and so I think you got this point where managers starting to realize that they've sunk a lot of money into this machine learning, but weren't necessarily getting the business value out of it that they're expecting and they could get. Um, so MLOps, I think, is, like you say, is a um, growing aspect of people realizing actually making deployment easy is a really important part. Um, and it also comes into the agility of where software, where 10 years ago, realized that actually um, prototyping quickly, getting um, MVPs out and iterating um, and getting feedback as quick as possible is really important. So actually trying to... Um, tackle ML deployment only after you've got your final best model is too late. You want to get a model really quickly, get feedback. Is it good or not? Is it giving you the value you need? If not, go back and forth. Um, so MLOps for me is not just about like how do you deploy a model, but how do you deploy a model from day one? Like okay. you don't wait until your model's finished. You do it from the start and use that to kind of get all the benefits that, that we've seen like agility and software. Um, and bring those same learnings to ML. Kind of like that fail first mindset. Exactly. Yes. So if it's a rubbish model, we'd rather know within a week. Then, yes. I guess let's not try and perfect it for two months. Then find no one really likes this. <laughs> We've got to go back to the start. Exactly. The the sooner you learn that, the sooner you can fix the problems and find a new solution. Yeah. Uh, going back to some of what you said, and I guess this is going to tie into MLOps, mm -hmm. what, what sort of challenges do you have around, I guess, scalability and mm -hmm. scaling some of those models and putting them into production? You said big data was mm -hmm. going to be a challenge for you and concurrency yes. was going to be a challenge for you. So uh, how, how do you handle I guess all of that complexity around some of the data as well. Right. So you've, like you say, you've got a few complexities. There's the big data involved. You've got multiple users all making requests at the same time. Uh, you've got certain models require GPUs to run at any reasonable speed. Um, but GPUs are very expensive. So when they're not being used, you don't want them to be idly sat there. 
Um, and obviously, cloud computing has um, enabled us to do these things a lot more easily than they are, were before. Um, but even so, kind of getting servers to spin up and down as and when they're needed, when load becomes bigger or smaller. Um, sometimes you can um, you have a big data set and you need a large amount of RAM. Um, sometimes you have a big data set, but actually the work can be split up over multiple smaller servers. Um, and yeah, and you're not like you're not building. We're not building this system at least just for one customer and one use case. Where we're like, we know exactly what functions they're going to do, so we can hard code it for those. I mean, building a system that's generic to kind of the changing requirements, and as like different types of models can be optimized in different types of ways. So kind of handling and supporting all those options um, adds a lot of challenge. Um, uh, another challenge for us is that with B2B, um, all our clients have isolated accounts. So they basically all have their own AWS accounts. Um, they can't accidentally share data with each other or anything. Um, and in doing that means we're basically managing 10, 15, 20 different um, versions of the platform deployed in different areas. Um, and so with that becomes a lot of the challenge of like making sure some of them spin up more instances, some spin up less. How can we save us and the customers money by not by spinning down servers when they're not needed? But then when they need something, we can spin it back up as quickly as possible. And those kind of optimizations. Who looks after that at Monolith? Uh, at the moment, myself, um, it's a it's a typically is a DevOps um, function, um, but most startups don't need a DevOps and en dedicated DevOps engineer. Um, it's like a, particularly in B two C, you have one like two versions of your platform: your staging and production, yeah. uh, maybe a third testing one, um, and you don't need anything quite this complex. But because we've deployed an on AWS accounts we manage, sometimes on a client's AWS account, sometimes on-prem. Um, it's got its own challenges involved in dealing that, with that. Um, so yes, yeah, so a lot of DevOps work that's needed. Um, and so yeah, we've had like DevOps um, consultants come in for brief periods to help manage this, um, but it's not always a full-time role, nor is it the cheapest role to hire for. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> We, we touched on MLOps, mm -hmm. and uh, that's obviously a, a relatively new term in the ML space. Do, do you see things at the moment that you see starting to take a little bit more traction in, in or around data science or data engineering that yourselves at Monolith are thinking, oh, that that's going to be interesting. That's going to be a big thing, or that's really going to help us. Yeah. So obviously, re um, more recently, Kubernetes has taken off hugely, and you see, uh, I mean, almost every company trying it of some form at the moment. Uh, I think one one of the challenges there is that managing a Kubernetes cluster is quite difficult. It requires a lot of work on its own, um, and for one thing we've noticed is kind of giving the data scientists the sort of flexibility to manage how things are deployed depl um, and how things, how their models are being used is quite important. Um, uh, a data scientist understands that this type of model can be optimized in this way and works well on smaller servers, or this type of model needs a GPU for just this portion of the model, but other like pre-processing and um, aspects don't need a GPU mm -hmm. um, and kind of enabling the data scientists to control the infrastructure in more granularity I think is really important um, and you are seeing this happening at the moment right. as people look at like the dockerization and how you can put more power within um, the docker containers to manage these things um, but I think for me at least I think you'll see Kubernetes um, have to kind of give that power up and or help um, become more user friendly for less DevOpsy people to manage um, and control. That's quite interesting. Let's wait and see how that evolves. Uh, as as CTO of an AI company that's that's growing fast and doing some seriously interesting stuff, what what challenges keep you up at night? 
uh, many, many. Uh, I think the scale, definitely scaling aspects are quite big. Um, it's kind of, um, but in terms of not just kind of the data aspect of scaling, but also can we handle all the use cases that we could be coming at us? Um, we obviously have tackled a lot and done well in them. Um, but use cases change as you, as we go into different industries, they have different types of data. Um, they're facing different problems um, and understanding when we see a new problem, that's okay. We can come up with new models, but are we set up um, sufficiently well so that if one of our research engineers starts working on a new model, how quickly can we integrate that and get it to a customer? Okay. Um, there's, um, yeah, like obviously we're a startup. We're build, building a lot of things as we go along. Um, but kind of that ability to move quickly requires a really strong kind of base platform to support that. Um, and trying to think ahead of the possible challenges helps kind of feed into being prepared. Yeah. Is, is it a false mindset that I've got that you've built models that learn? Okay, uh, that are self-learning, that can feed that back into you. Is it a false mindset that I think potentially these are your hardest years and your scale will just hit a really nice trajectory once your platform has learned enough that it can advise you on maybe different images, different patterns, yeah. and what to do with a customer, what not to do? Or am I just am I just crazy? <laughs> no, no, it definitely scales better over time, um, but it's in the same way that uh, delivery to food delivery. Like, I'm not on the surface, that's not that hard. At some point, you don't need to hire anyone else. It just keeps growing. But in reality, it's hugely growing, and they'll keep hiring people to do more. Um, I think there's there's always challenges. You can always make models more accurate or make them faster to train and predict. Um, new techniques come out to handle different types of data. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also aspects of usability. How do we make it as easy as possible to use? Um, right, Monolith came out of um, a lot of inspiration from Jarvis, from Iron Man, and kind of this idea of you saying, like, I need my suit to be 20% lighter do it for me and kind of um, obviously we're not quite there yet um, but moving towards that vision is still like the goal and kind of making it as easy and lightweight for someone to use um, I think will be a continuous um, kind of challenge for us. That, that's a really interesting concept. <laughs> Let's dress you up in an Iron Man suit then. <laughs> <laughs> Gladly. <laughs> um, uh, lastly, before we go, um, I, I typically do this. You're, you're a massively interesting business at the moment. Uh, I think there'll be a lot of people listening that it does pique their interest and they're probably quite keen to understand um, if you're hiring or how you're hiring. So what kind of people are you looking for? Do they need PhDs? Do they not need PhDs? Um, can you give us a bit of insight? Sure. Um, no, you don't definitely don't need a PhD. That's for sure. Um, we have, a, like I said, we have a mix of people. So we have software developers, and that ranges from front end developers, back end developers, full stack. Um, like I said, we use Python back ends, like React front ends. Um, and then on the data science team, again, we have a mix of data scientists. Some are quite like software data scientists, kind of what you see of like data pipeline management. Um, then you have a lot of data scientists doing the more ML research, like tweaking models, improving models. You have data scientists that work with clients closely, understanding their needs, helping helping the client build the model that will be best for their particular data set. Okay. Um, so quite a broad range. Um, so software uh, across both software and data science. Nice. So the full circle of the data science orientation, back end yeah. engineers, front end engineers. If you're interested in Python, React front ends, Sarah is your guy. Go and talk to Sarah. Uh, there's a collection of links that you can check out. LinkedIn pages, reference to websites, We'll include all of that for you. 
reach out to Sarah if you've got any questions. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us um, before we leave you, Sarah? No, I think that's everything. It was a pleasure chatting and yeah, always keen to hear people, even if you're just interested to know about what Monolith do, how we do it. Um, always happy to chat. Yeah. Follow Monolith AI, follow engineers, share our content. Um, like Sarah said, we're always really keen to have a conversation as well. Um, we'd be really keen to hear, again, some of your stories. So reach out to us. We'd really appreciate that. From Sarah and I, it's goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching this episode. Uh, massively appreciate you listening and checking in with us. If you want to find out more about us and what we're doing, please check us out on social media. What we're trying to do at Engineers is build a community to drive knowledge sharing and experiences. On Twitter, we can be found at engineers.io. It's no underscore. We've also got a website, which is engineers.io. These links will all be posted in the description. Any feedback and comments are massively appreciated. We're always looking to improve on where we can. Thanks, guys.